a mighty voice. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Well, good morning. good morning. Good to see you this weekend. Glad you could be with us and uh, looking forward to a good day in the Lord's house. Uh, Jeremiah, would you mind opening us in prayer this morning as we begin our service? Amen. You may be seated. When Jesus died upon the cross, he had made the sacrifice. And I'm so glad there is no need for him to do it twice. The awful debt of sin I owed was paid in full that day. Salvation's work was finished so that I can truly say there will never be another cavalry. He died once for all and he opened heaven for me. Jesus took the sting from death when he won the victory, and there will never be another Calvary. The deed was done. The lots were cast, and my Lord gave up the ghost. They tried to make a mockery of the one who loved them most. But three days later, he would prove his word for all to see. The grave denied and hell defied, now he lives eternally and there will never be another cavalry he died once for all and he opened heaven for me Jesus took the sting from death when he won the victory
Amen. Stand, if you would, again. 369. Springs of living water, let's stand to sing. 369. <laughs> I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water. the choir is going to come down and join you folks as the ladies play shake hands greet those around you as they play If you need your hymn book for that third verse, we're going to sing it. Oh, sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? The third verse, here we go. Oh, sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? A fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free, where thirsting spirits can be satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul they satisfy, drinking at the springs of living water, the wonderful and bountiful supply. Amen. Good singing this morning. Men, if you'd come forward, we'll take this morning's tithes and offerings. And I appreciate Chuck helping us out this week. Pastor Joey's on vacation, and uh, so appreciate Chuck stepping in and helping us this week. One prayer request I wanted to make you aware of. How many of you know uh, Pastor Rory Bond over at Grace Baptist in Muncie? Uh, he is having a quadruple bypass tomorrow morning uh, at 730. And so they just asked if we'd be in prayer for him. And uh, he's pretty young. And so just uh, pray for him. Pray he would recover quickly. And the Lord would be with him. Uh, Pat, would you mind praying for us this morning? Amen. You may be seated.
Well, we had a great week down in Branson this last week with our senior saints, and uh, we had a good time, didn't we? We uh, had a lot of fun, ate way too much food, and, uh, but it was enjoyable. And I just want to take a minute and thank uh, Mary and Teresa. They put so much work into that, and uh, it was just a fantastic trip. And so thank you for that. I, uh, one, of the, one of the positives I wasn't expecting out of this trip is I've got a lot of new sermon material now. And uh, it's got, Ronnie's got his ho- own sermon series, I think. And so, so we'll, uh, uh, had a great time with him this week. And thank you so much for putting that together. A few announcements for you. I uh, wanted to remind you on the back, you probably saw our Operation Christmas Child Chew Box uh, ministry. And if you would like to be part of that, the information is on the table. We're trying to put together a hundred boxes that we can send out to kids. And uh, part of that will be the gospel will go with it, and they go all over the world. And so if you'd like to be part of that ministry, you can grab a box, uh, put some toys in it that the kids would enjoy. And any questions, you can see uh, Amy on that, all right? And then we have a game night on October 15th. That'll be at 530 here at the church. That's a Saturday. And so uh, make note of that. And then uh, for the calendar, if you got a calendar at the beginning of the year, you had marked on there that we have revival coming up. And we actually got a phone call eh, maybe two weeks ago now uh, that our speaker had some personal issues come up and cannot come. And so instead of trying to replace that, uh, we have the retirement weekend coming up in a couple weeks. We're just going to not have that this fall. Uh, So make note of that. Uh, We won't have revival. uh, But we do have our retirement weekend. And that is two weeks from today, October 21st, that Friday. We'll have a banquet here at the church. That'll be at 6 o'clock. And uh, if you could RSVP for that, we're getting a pretty full list of people, which is good. But we just want to make sure we're prepared and have enough seating and food. And so uh, if you could let Karis know that, text her or email, uh, that would be a help. And then that Sunday will be a special service. And so make note that it will be 9 o'clock Sunday school. Uh, 9.45, we'll have a brunch, and then at 10.30 will be the main service that week, and uh, we'll have some special things during that service. So uh, that's coming up in just a couple weeks, and so make note of that as well. Then the last thing I have for you is first through sixth grade are going to have an activity to Whitetail Tree Farm, and that will be on September 29th at 10 a.m. You'll just meet out there, and the cost for that is $6.50 per kid. All right. Well, I think that's all the announcements we have this morning. So Chuck, why don't you come and lead us in one more song? All right. You can remain seated for this last song, 521. I think all of us, if we're honest, would say we would really like the Lord to use us as a, as a conduit for his love and his word. And that's what this song talks about, channels only. Um, but with all thy wondrous power flowing through us, that the Lord would make a, a channel for him to use us Page 521. How I praise thee, precious Savior, that thy love laid hold of me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel be. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power. Every day and every hour Emptied that thou shouldest fill me A clean vessel in thy hand With no power but as thou givest Graciously with each command Channels only, blessed Master But with all thy wondrous power Thou canst use us every day and every hour. Jesus, fill now. Jesus, fill now with thy spirit. Hearts that full surrender know that the streams of living water from our inner man may flow. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all wondrous power flowing through us thou canst use us every day and every hour good singing this morning
Thank you for that. And uh, if you would turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes 7 and Junior Church. If you are still in here, you are welcome to go back. I think Austin and Savannah have a good Junior Church plan for you guys today. And so Ecclesiastes chapter 7 is where we'll be as we're going through our series, Made for More. Dave, can I get a little more volume? If you don't mind, my voice is a little hoarse this morning. Ecclesiastes 7, we've been going through a series called Made for More. We're walking through the book of Ecclesiastes to see what God has for us. And this is our fourth week. And we began with probably the most important message of the series, and that is we are made for God. Amen. And I was talking to uh, Patty this morning, and she made the comment, I, I don't know how people are able to go through life without faith in God. And I tell you, there's a lot of truth to that statement. Without God, I mean, what is the purpose of life? Where do you find joy in life? Where do you find peace in life? And uh, Ecclesiastes shows us those things are not found outside of God. But we're here this morning because we believe Jesus Christ changes that, amen? amen. And we believe he gives life purpose, he gives life peace, he gives satisfaction, he gives uh, a life worth living. And so we're made for God. And then we looked at we were made for seasons. And how God orchestrates the seasons of our lives, just as he orchestrates the seasons of nature. And, and wherever you are today is because God has allowed you to be in that season of life. And there's beauty in it, and there's blessing in it. So be content, but at the same time, be faithful to the purpose he's called you to in this season. And then last week, we had one of your favorite messages, I think, and that is we were made for rest. <laughs> I told you you need to sleep more. And uh, we do not serve an oppressive God. 
We don't serve a God that, that is a berating God, a, a, a dictator God. We serve a loving God, a gracious God, and he's made us for rest, and he allows us to rest. And the reason we can rest is because he is the one that watches the city. Do you remember that? And because he's watching the city and he's taking care of it, you don't have to. And you can rest, and really resting is trusting. And today we're going to look at Ecclesiastes 7, one of my favorite passages. And let's look at verse 19. And I want to see that we were made for wisdom. Verse 19, it says this. Wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. We'll walk through this passage, uh, the whole chapter really. Uh, but let's just stop there for now. Let's ask the Lord to, to be with us today. And Lord, we thank you for how good you are to us. We thank you for the good week you've given us of fellowship as we had the trip uh, over to Branson, the safety and the, the, just the joy that was. And Lord, I thank you that uh, you are a God that shows us how to live life. You don't just let us figure it out through trial and error, but you show us what life's supposed to look like, what it's supposed to be about. And I pray that you would just be with us this morning. Give me the words to say and that it would be a time of encouragement, uh, a time of refocusing. And we just thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, in Ecclesiastes 7, Solomon cannot emphasize strong enough how much we need wisdom. He says that wisdom strengthens the wise more than ten mighty men which are in a city. He, he said in the same way a group of strong soldiers will give protection to a city, he says that's what wisdom will do in your life. Wisdom brings protection in your life. Wisdom keeps you from things that would destroy your life. Wisdom keeps you from things that would destroy your marriage. Wisdom th keeps you from things that would destroy and ruin your children. Wisdom keeps you from wrecking your career. Young people, wisdom is what keeps you from ruining your future. There is not one of us here that would say we are not in need of wisdom. And we need God's wisdom. And Solomon, he very emphatically says that wisdom is very essential in our lives. But he also says towards the end of the chapter that wisdom is very rare. It's hard to find a wise man or a wise woman. I heard one guy say the problem with common sense today is it's just not that common. Have you heard that before? And Solomon, he says that, that every day you're making decisions, big decisions and small decisions. And, and if you want to protect your life and the things that are most important to your life, you need wisdom. Wisdom is what guards the things that are most important to you. It guards your family, it guards your career, it guards your future. Wisdom is essential for our lives. And Solomon, he's an interesting man, because if you remember his life when he was young, he asked God for wisdom, and God gave it to him. In fact, he was the wisest man to have ever lived. And as he was a young man, he lived with wisdom. He made wise choices. He had wise pursuits. But as he got on into life, he he stopped engaging that wisdom, and he stopped utilizing it, and he began to live very foolishly. He knew what to do, he just didn't do it. He, he remember, he, he started pursuing the wrong things, and he ended up with, uh, what was it, a thousand wives and concubines, and served idols, and, and just all these foolish choices. And he had all this wisdom, but, but he never engaged it. I, I picture it this way. Have you ever hopped on your mower and started mowing, and you get two or three strips down and realize you, you never put the blade on. Anybody else have that happen to them before? I had uh, something similar to that a couple years ago. We used to live on the corner of Riley and Main over by the school. And Pat and Kim, they live uh, just down on Lawson, so pretty close. And he, I forget, you were gone on vacation or something. He said, you said, Brian, would you mind coming over and mowing my yard? I said, sure. And so I, uh, that week I hopped on my mower and I put in my little uh, earbuds and some podcasts. And I'm just enjoying myself. And so I drive from my house down, uh, down uh, Riley Road, down to Lawson, mow his yard and finish it all up. And I come back and, and uh, it's a pretty busy road, you know, Riley Road. And so, so I'm kind of driving in people's yards, coming back and all that sort of thing. And, and I get back and I'm about to pull in my shed I looked down, and I had left my blade on the whole way. And there's a path going from Pat's house all the way down Riley Road to my house. And uh, that's, that's why we had to move. That's why we don't live there anymore. <laughs> Neighbors didn't like that so much. Well, well Solomon, he kind of had the opposite. He, he had all this wisdom. God had blessed him with this wisdom, and he, he just never engaged it. 
He, he started living foolishly and making foolish choices, and it, it really, honestly, it wrecked his life. And now as an older man, he's writing this, and he's looking back on it, and he, he, he's begging us, don't live the way I lived. Don't, don't live foolishly. Live with some wisdom. And one of the reasons I really like this passage is it puts some handles on what it looks like to have wisdom. You know, we talk about wisdom all the time and how we need to be wise and make wise choices, but, but this gives some very, very lower shelf, practical, simple ways to understand what does wisdom look like. And I like that. I'm a practical guy. Uh, if it's too, too high over there, it's going over my head, you know. So I like this. He gives us, I, I see, five principles of what wisdom looks like. And there's a lot more in this passage, but we can't get to it all, so we're going to stick with five. And, and I want you to see five marks of wisdom. The first one we see in verse number one is this, wisdom sees farther. Verse one says this, chapter seven, verse one, a good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth, or day of one's birth. That, that's, a, that's a strange phrase. To say that the day you die is more significant than the day you are born. When we had each of our children, we have three kids, and each of them, when they were born, that was a time of celebration. Do you remember that? When you had a child that was born or a grandkid that was born, and, and that was a time that you celebrated, wasn't it? It was a time of great joy and all that. Me and my mom have the exact same birthday, different year, same day. You, you're with me, right? <laughs> And uh, she says, she says all the time, she says, she says, you were the best birthday present I ever got. Isn't that sweet? And uh, I don't think they were that excited about Joey or Rachel, but for me, <laughs> they were pretty excited. And when a child is born, that's a day of celebration. Now, here's the point. Here's, here's the big thought of this verse. What he's saying is this. He says, you need to live your life in such a way that when you die, the celebration of your life is greater than the celebration of your birth. Did you get that? Live your life in such a way that, that when you go out, there is a celebration by your children and your, your family and those that knew you of the life that you lived. He, he's saying, look to the end of your life, and in that moment, think, what do I wish I would have done and live that way now? At the end of your life, when you're on your deathbed, imagine that. Make it, make it like a long time from now. You're like 110, okay? But on your deathbed, looking back on your life, what will you wish you had done? Well, what, what will you wish you had invested your life in? Will you wish that you had spent more time with your family and your friends? Do you, do you, will you wish that you had been more kind and patient with your children? I, I've done several funeral now, funerals now, and what I've realized is that a funeral, the children and the spouse, they, they, they do not pull out their dad's resume and say, look what he accomplished, or look at his bank account. What, what they talk about is, was dad there for me? They, they talk about the time he had spent with them and taking them on vacation and how he always got them a Coke at this gas station and, and the time he had invested. What is it you will wish you had done at the end of your life? Will you wish you had spent more time serving God? Will you wish that you had told more people about him and brought more with you into the kingdom of heaven? What is it that at the end of your life you will wish you had done? He says, look at that and do it now. Stephen Covey, he gets the credit for his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He, he gives the principle of begin with the end in mind. Have you heard that before? Well, he gets credit for it, but really it was Solomon that wrote this principle 3,000 years before Stephen Covey ever said it. Live your so life in such a way that the celebration of your life is greater than the celebration of your birth. It looks farther. It, it sees the end. It sees where you want to go, and it makes decisions now based on what you, the end of your life wants to be. Wisdom sees farther. Not only does wisdom see farther, but wisdom thinks deeper. Look at verses 2, and we'll go down through verse 7. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, and the heart of the fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of wise than for a man, than for a man to hear 
the Song of Fools. First, the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is laughter of the fool, and also is vanity. Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. Well, he makes some statements here that on the surface seem pretty counterintuitive. He starts out and he says that it is better to go to a funeral than it is to go to a party. He says it's better to be sorrowful than it is to have laughter. He says it's better to be in the house of mourning than the house of mirth. He says it's better to listen to rebuke than it is to listen to your favorite song. And on the surface, we listen to the statements and we say, that can't be right. Given any one of those four choices, I would not pick what Solomon picked. And, and why would he say those things are better? Well, the answer is in verse 3. He says at the end of verse 3 that for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. You see, Solomon is not saying that God is against laughter, that he's against having fun, or he's against enjoying life. He, he's saying that the times of heartache in your life are the times where God grows you and makes you what you need to be. And he says the discomfort that comes with those seasons is worth it because that is what God uses to change you. Uh, I've heard it said that a sailboat, no matter which direction the wind is blowing, they can turn their sail in such a way that they can either sail with the, sin, the, uh, with the wind and away from the wind, or they can turn it in such a way that they actually use that wind uh, to drive into the wind and go towards it. And I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know, that, that is a lot like the trials in our life. The, the way you choose to set your sails in the midst of a trial will determine whether it drives you from God or whether it drives you closer to God. It'll determine in that time that either you will become bitter and cynical and distant from God, or you will allow those times to drive you deeper and closer and into a deeper relationship with the Lord. I was talking to a friend of mine from college this week. He called, and uh, he's a youth pastor down south, and, and he asked, how's the church doing? You know, he's kind of known what we've gone through the last couple of years, and, and uh, I was talking to him, and I said this. I said, you know, it, it, if I'm being honest with you, the, the last year, year and a half, has been challenging. Uh, I said, especially the year 2021 and the beginning of 2022, 20, uh, those, those were challenging times. But I said, what, what was interesting is what we saw is as a church, that could have divided us. But instead, we used that time, and, and God used it to grow us deeper in our walk with God and our trust in him and grow us deeper in our unity as a church. And, and instead of that driving us away from God, it drove us to God. And I, I said, what's interesting about that is now I feel as we're past that, we are seeing a lot of the fruit from that season being buried in our church in many different ways. Because we allowed a time that was a time of trial and we didn't waste it. And what Solomon is saying is this, a wise person doesn't waste their pain. He looks at the down days as days of development. He looks at the painful days as days of progress. Matthew Henry says this, he says, that is best for, uh, best for us which is best for our souls, by which the heart is made better, though it be unpleasing to the senses. Solomon says wisdom thinks deeper. In the down days, it looks at that as a chance to grow in their walk with God, a chance to deepen their relationship with him and to trust him more, and wisdom looks deeper. Number three, three I see that wisdom waits longer. Look at verse eight. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient is in spirit is better than the proud in heart. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. What he's saying here is this. Wisdom refuses to get ahead of God. It's patience. And I don't know about you, but I struggle with that one. I'm a very impatient person. Anyone else like that? I, uh, I, do you hate it? I go to the store, and I look at the checkout line, and what do you do? You scan for the shortest line, the fastest moving line, and you hop in that line, and what happens to that line? It stops. I mean, just dead stops every time. And the other lines are going back. And if you switch lines, it doesn't matter, because then that one stops, you know. 
and I hate it. I hate waiting in line. I hate it when a, a restaurant's slow with my food. I hate driving behind somebody that's slow. I just hate waiting. Anybody else with me? All right, a few of you, okay? Some of you are saying, I can't wait for you to be done with this sermon right now, right? <laughs> and uh, I hate waiting. I'm impatient. What, what Solomon's saying here is this. He's saying wisdom is persistence, and yet it is patient when it waits on God's timing. It doesn't get ahead of God. It, it reminds us that God is the one who sees the big picture of our life. He, he sees what needs to happen, and he sees when it needs to happen. And when we are patient and wait on the Lord, what we are doing is we are trusting him. One person said that wisdom is making the decision I would make if I knew everything that God knows. You see, God knows the big picture. He knows what you need. He knows when you need it. And that is why his timing is perfect. Let me encourage you, don't get ahead of the Lord. Uh, young people, be patient on the Lord. Uh, I, I've told young people this for a long time. It is better to not have a boyfriend or girlfriend than it is to get ahead of the Lord and have the wrong boyfriend or girlfriend. Would you agree with that? Don't get ahead of the Lord. Be patient. You wait on his timing. Don't, don't get so impatient that you ruin God's future blessings by jumping ahead of him. There is a basketball player by the name of A.C. Green. Anybody remember A.C. Green? He was drafted by the Lakers in 1985, and uh, that's when the Lakers were known as Showtime. They were the, uh, the biggest team in sports, and they could do whatever they wanted. Uh, they lived out in L.A., the Los Angeles Lakers, and, and uh, the guy, A.C. Green, was a Christian. And one of the things he said, he had made a vow that I will not, uh, I will not break my vows of purity until I'm married. I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to wait till he brings the right person, and, and I'm not going to get ahead of the Lord. Well, the rest of the Lakers, they, they thought this was a joke. And uh, when he came onto the team, they knew what he had decided to do. And so, so they started taking bets amongst themselves how long he was going to last before he gave in and broke his commitment. And to the point that they tried to set him up and get him to fail, and, and he never did. For six years, from 1985 to 1991, he, he never broke that. He said, I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to wait on God's timing. And all of the rest of the team, they, they thought that, that that was just ridiculous, that you were going to take that type of a stand until 1991, when a guy by the name of Magic Johnson found out that he had contracted HIV. Do you remember that? And the, the story goes that the rest of the members of that team and even the former teammates were, were terrified, and, and they all had to go and get tested, except for A.C. Green, because he'd waited on the Lord. I'm just saying, don't get ahead of the Lord in your life. Don't, don't get impatient and, and try to manipulate things and maneuver things to where they're the way you want them to be. You be patient. And God says wisdom waits longer. It waits on God's timing. It doesn't get ahead of the Lord. Wisdom waits longer. Then number four, we see that wisdom forgives faster. Look at verse 20, if you'd skip down with me. It says in verse 20, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Also take no heed unto all the words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee, for oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise has, cur has cursed others. He says here, don't take heed to the hurtful words that other people have said about you. You ever had someone say something to you or about you that was just unfair, uh, unnecessary? You ever have someone do something to you that was unfair or unnecessary? The, the wisdom that Solomon gives here is this. Don't heed that. In other words, don't become fixated on that. Don't let that be something that controls you. Don't become bitter. Don't become angry. Don't become cynical. Don't, don't become a bitter person when others have sinned against you. And he tells us the reason for that in verse 20. The reason you shouldn't be upset and bitter at other sins towards you is because in verse 20, for there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. The reason we need to forgive others of their sins is because we're just as guilty, amen? There, there's not a one of us here who hasn't messed up, who hasn't sinned. And he's saying that He's reminding us that God has forgiven you of your sins. So why do you deserve to refuse to forgive someone else? We, when we were on the trip, the, the last night we were there, 
we went to a play. It's a sight and sounds play, and it was uh, Jesus was the one they'd done. Anybody seen that before? And uh, just really incredible. And uh, very well done, and the, the effects and all that sort of thing. And, and the particular play we went to was the story of Christ. And it kind of started with his earthly ministry and went through his life. And, and as this play went on, you just see this Jesus who's so compassionate and kind and, and just transformative in the way he deals with people. And, and it works all the way through until the night of his crucifixion. And they, they portray Christ as he's in the garden and, and as he's taking on the sins of the world. He's, he, he's drinking the sewage of our sin. And he's, he's not just taking on our sin, he's becoming our sin. And they show him as they, they take him and they beat him and they, they hung him on that cross. You can just see it, the, 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 the wounds and, and the, the, just, uh, the torture that he'd been put through. And he's up there and he's hanging on that cross. And they, they show him as he takes his last breath and they, they lower his body from the cross, limp and, and lifeless, and they put him in the tomb. And, and they did that. Did, did anybody else's allergies act up a little bit when you saw that? What was going through my mind was this. I don't know about you, but as I, I was watching that portrayal of what Christ had done, I kept thinking of the fact that I was the one who did that to him. It was my sin that put him on that cross. And if God can forgive me for what I did to him, surely I can forgive others for what they've done to me. You may say, well, they, they don't deserve to be forgiven. You're probably right. You can say, well, that what they did to me was unfair, and, and you're probably right. But I know in Ephesians, God tells us that we are to forgive one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. There's not a just man on the earth. There's not one of us that deserved God's forgiveness. And yet God says, I chose to forgive you. Why cannot you choose to forgive the one who sinned against you? Wisdom forgives faster. It refuses to live life with bitterness and anger and hatred. It, it chooses to forgive, not because the other person deserves it, but they choose to forgive because they've been forgiven. And then finally, I want you to see in verse 13 through 15 that wisdom surrenders sooner. Look at verse 13. Consider the work of God, for who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful, but in the day of adversity, consider, God also hath set one over against the other, to the end that man should find nothing after him. All these things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. You know, there are certain things in our lives that God either does or God allows that we do not completely understand and we cannot change. And even if we would like to change them, there's nothing we can do about them. And he tells us what, what God has made crooked, no man can make straight. Some of you with curly hair on a humid day, you know that verse is true, right? What God has made crooked, we can't make straight. He says there are some men who are wicked men and they get to live long, lasting lives. And there are some men who are righteous men and they die young. And in our minds, we say that's not right. How could God allow something like that? And it doesn't make sense to us, and we cannot change that. And, and our tendency is to fight God on those things. But what he's saying here is this, wisdom surrenders sooner. It comes to God and says, God, even though I do not completely understand what you are doing right now, I am going to choose to trust you in the midst of it. It's a wise thing to trust God and to surrender to him. Have you ever fought God about something? Don't raise your hand, but, but maybe you're fighting God about something right now. Maybe there's someone, like we talked about a minute ago, that God is, is speaking to your heart that you need to forgive them. You need to make things right with them, and, and you just don't want to do it. Uh, maybe there's something or someone in your life that you know you need to get out, but, but you just don't want to do it, so you kind of ignore God and fight him on that. Maybe there's something God's called you to a ministry, a future, a, a college career, whatever it may be. And, and in your heart, we can come up with every excuse in the book on why we shouldn't do what God wants us to do, shouldn't we? Let me just encourage you with this. When God wins, it's a good thing. 
uh, as I was youth pastor, one of the things I saw over and over again was this mindset that, that if I were to surrender my life to God and just give it completely to him to do whatever he wants with, that that, that would just be the most miserable life you could possibly have. Have you, have you thought that way before? And if I surrender this area of my life to God, or, or if I give my life completely to God, that, that it's just going to ruin my life. I, uh, let me encourage you, if that's the way you view God, your view of God is warped. We serve a good God. And, and when you give your life to God, and God wins in your life, that's a good thing. When we lose and God wins, that's a good thing in our life. The, the story I would always tell the teenagers, and they've heard this probably a hundred times, so sorry teens, but, but you're getting it one more time, is I would tell them to help them uh, try to picture how they should view God. I would tell them a story about when Emily was two years old, and uh, we had saved up all that year to go to Disney World. And we're about a week away, maybe two weeks away, and we're in the, the, the kitchen there, and, and I said, I said, Carrie, do you think I should tell Emily? And she's two years old at this point, you know, and we didn't want to make her wait too long because you know how impatient they are and, and all that sort of thing. And so uh, I said, I said, can I tell her? And she said, all right, if you want to tell her, you can tell her. And I said, I said, okay, okay. And so uh, Emily's in her bedroom back in the house and playing, and, and I said, I said, hey, Emily, I said, hey, come here. And she's two years old, you know, and so she kind of uh, waddles, you know, I don't know what they do at that age. They kind of, kind of stagger in and, and she, she stands in front of me and she says, she says, what dad? And I said, I said, Emily, I said, in two weeks, me and you and mommy, we are going to Disney world. And she got just the biggest smile on her face. Her two little chubby arms, she threw them up in the air. She starts jumping up and down. And uh, like, she is just, she is just pumped that we're going to Disney world. And it took, me, it took me about two minutes to realize she's two years old. She has no clue what Disney World is. <laughs> she, doesn't, she doesn't know about the rides. She doesn't know about the princesses. She, she doesn't know any of that. Here's what she knew. She knew if Dad's excited about taking me there, it must be pretty great. That's what she knew. She trusted the heart of her father. And that's the heart that Christians should have towards God. We have a God who, when we surrender to him, that's the best thing you can do with your life. He tells us in Jeremiah 21, 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to stop fighting God. When God wins, it's a good thing. And here's Solomon, he says, a wise person surrenders sooner. Wisdom, it sees farther, it thinks deeper, it waits longer, it forgives faster, and it surrenders sooner. Will you bow with me in prayer? Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor Brian, you talked about forgiveness today, and how Christ, he hung on the cross, and he died so that our sins could be forgiven. I don't know that I've ever accepted that gift of forgiveness but that's something I'm concerned about. I, I don't know I'd go to heaven. I don't know if I've accepted that gift, but I'd like to know. If that's you, we won't call you out. We won't embarrass you. But would you just raise your hand so we can pray with you? I don't know that I'd go to heaven if I died, but I'm concerned about that. Just slip your hand up and slip it right back down. We won't call you out. We won't embarrass you. But I need to be saved. Well, Christian, let me ask you this. Maybe there's something in your life, as we talked about, that you're fighting God on. Maybe you're angry at something he's allowed in your life. Maybe he's calling you to something that, that you haven't surrendered over to him. And you say, Pastor Brian, today is the day that needs to change. And you would say, Brian, I surrender what God has called me to give up in my life. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? There's some areas in my life that I'm holding on to, I'm fighting God on, and I need to surrender those. Amen. Lord, we thank you for today. I thank you for this church family that desires to know you and desires to surrender to you and to follow you. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would just help us as we go from here to live that out this week. We praise you for all you've done. Pray for those that can't be here today, that you would just strengthen them and allow them to come back soon. We thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you are looking to join the church today, as we stand here in a moment, I'd invite you to come to the front. And we'll have someone pray with you. But if you would, stay with me, please. Turn to hymn number...
hymn 476 as we sing together hymn 476. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his blessings daily. Forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. 